um, we'll let the last join late and we will get into some wine. So if you don't have the La Pepe Muscadet in your glass uh, yet, please get it into your glass and start enjoying it. Uh, we're going to take the first few minutes just to talk a little bit about food pairings. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, obviously there's lots of great food on the table. Hopefully you'll have great friends around you uh, somewhere. If not, family members, uh, even if it's just a couple of you, that's all you need to celebrate Thanksgiving. And it's really, really fun to have a bunch of different wines on the table for Thanksgiving. At the end of this, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our Thanksgiving packs uh, that we put together specifically for the Thanksgiving table. And good wine always makes good food even better. Uh, makes friendships even better. Well, it depends on how much wine you drink. Sometimes uh, too much wine can make the friendships a little uh, stressed, um, but then always seem to come back around. So food and wine, it's a match made in heaven. It's a big part of why I fell in love with wine is because early on in my restaurant career, I got to taste really good wine with really good food. And I saw that when you have the right ones together, it can make both things even better. Uh, and that's the goal for food pairings is to bring out the best in both the food and the wine. And as we're talking through this, the most important rule to remember when it comes to food pairings is that you need to drink a wine that you enjoy. That is the number one rule. Yes, white with fish. Yes, white with poultry. Yes, white with pork are the classic uh, pairings and they work really, really well most of the time but don't get stuck into those rules. Uh, rules, as they say, are meant to be broken. And same with wine and food pairing rules. Yes, you can do red with fish. Yes, you can do red with chicken. Yes, you can do red with poultry or pork. Uh, you can also do white with meats that you would traditionally do reds with. If you're a white drinker, you could drink a big full white wine with a steak. You could drink an orange wine with a steak. Will it be as good as a red wine, maybe not, depending on the steak, depending on the preparation, but that doesn't mean it's going to be bad. So first rule, always drink a wine that you're going to enjoy. Second rule uh, has to do with flavor profiles. So taste, we talk a lot about it here. It is very uh, individual and it's a sensation of perceived flavor. So it's what you perceive it to be. The categories of flavor being sweet, salty, bitter, sour, umami, and fat. Those are the ones that you want to match up certain wine characteristics to when you're thinking about wine and food pairings. Uh, wine doesn't have fattiness. It does have body weight, and you want to match weight of body with wine with weight of food, uh, as we'll get into. Spiciness, this isn't talking about uh, baking spices, which can sometimes get into wine, or even, you know, bell pepper aromas or jalapeno aromas, the aromas of those spicy fruits, it's talking about literal spiciness. So a wine can't be spicy the way food can be spicy. It can have flavors of things that make food spicy, but it won't have that heat. The caspican uh, that lights your mouth on fire, wine doesn't have that. It can have those flavors of spiciness again, but it can't have actual spice to the wine. Uh, and saltiness, you can't get salty in wine unless you add salt to wine. Now you can get flavors of saltiness. There are a couple wines that we have in our room that have saltiness in the flavor palette of the wine, but it can't actually have salt or that sodium uh, in the wine. Um, it does contain acidity, just like food does. It does contain sweetness uh, and bitterness and can have umami and earthy flavors. Um, and when pairing food and wine, you want those components to balance or enhance each other. There's two different ways that you can approach tastings, complementary or conflicting. Um, complementary is where you pair a buttery Chardonnay with a buttery lobster or a buttery soup. That's a complementary pairing. They are the same thing. Uh, uh, example of a, con a conflicting pairing would be spicy food with a sweet wine. Those are opposite flavors that are complementing each other. The spice goes well with the sweet and marries with both of those flavors. And so those are kind of the two approaches that you can take with 
pairing wine and food. So think about the components of the food and then we think about the things that are gonna pair well with the wine. And this is something that takes years and years and years of practice. And the best way to do it is just to dive right into it, get things wrong, get things right. I've been pairing wines for 20 years with food and I still get things wrong and I'm still surprised by certain pairings. And unless you try it, you're not gonna know if it works or not. Uh, and that's, really what is fun about the Thanksgiving packs is you can open up everything and you can try the wine with all the food and you can figure out which ones are going to pair the best with each dish or you can just drink them and enjoy them and not worry about the pairings uh, as much either way is fine there are so many dishes on the table for Thanksgiving I love this picture, Aaliyah. Great job as always with the slide deck, amazing. I can't wait for some green beans and some corn and some ham and some turkey and some mac and cheese and mashed potatoes and gravy. So tons of different flavors are gonna be on your Thanksgiving day table. Everybody who you have over if you're having guests are gonna have different palate preferences for wines. Not everybody is the same. Your friends aren't always going to like what you're going to like. And a lot of times friends have different palates. Couples have different palates. My wife and I have different palates. And, and although we agree on some wines, we disagree on a lot of wines as well. And that's okay. That's why there's so many wines out there in the world. That's so many, why there's so many different food preparations because there are so many different palates. Uh, so it's great to have a lot of wines on Thanksgiving table. Um, acidity is the biggest flavor component to look for uh, when it comes to food pairing. High acid wines tend to pair better with foods. They just do. Food needs acid, uh, just like it needs salty, sweet, bitter, uh, fatty. You want all of those components to be in balance. And so the wines that do the best on the table are also wines that have the best balance. And acidity is a big part of that balance. Uh, acidity helps fruit seem fresh. Uh, it helps wines from being overpowering uh, it helps them give you refreshment when you have that kind of salivation in your mouth after you've had an acidic wine. It really helps uh, and is preparing you for food. And that's why your mouth is salivating is because you want some food and you want some more wine. Uh, alcohol and tannin need to be in balance with the fattiness and the richness of the food. This is really important because a lot of wines that are popular, the high alcohol, really big, intense fruit bombs, don't necessarily pair that well with food. A lot of times the alcohol and the richness of the wine will overwhelm a lot of foods unless you're eating a giant ribeye steak uh, and sides with a lot of flavor and fattiness and richness. Um, if you have foods that have delicate flavors, like a 16% Napa Cab, isn't going to go great with turkey. Turkey is not really fatty and rich. Uh, now, depending on the gravy you're serving with it, that may give it some more richness and fattiness that will enable it to stand up to a fuller bodied wine. And we'll get into that at the very end as we do have a full bodied wine in the lineup. But for the most part, your medium bodied wines that have a great balance of acidity, alcohol, and tannin are going to be the best food pairing wines for red. And then for whites, uh, you know, your rich oaky buttery Chardonnays, unless you're doing a buttery soup or main lobster or something that would complement buttery flavors and characteristics, you're going to be better off with a Sauvignon Blanc, a Pinot Grigio, uh, or as we're going to get into this beautiful Muscadet. So that's just kind of a general overview of choosing food and wine pairings. Again, the best thing to do, and this is what I do most of the time when I'm entertaining or having people over, is I open up a bunch of different wines. I put them out on the table. I tell everybody to try a little bit of all of them, find their favorites, uh, and then enjoy everything with the meal. Um, if you're like me, I'm going to pour a little bit of all of them and then go back around the order again. Uh, because I like the variation. I like to see how they all pair with food. Um, but some people just want to stick to what they like and they'll just drink the same wine the whole time that they're over there. And that's okay. Um, people are, everybody's different in, in their preferences and in their enjoyments of wine and food. So getting into the very first wine that we have tonight, this is the La Pepe uh, Muscadet Sevre La Main. Um, that's a lot of words and we will break down what that means for you. So Muscadet is the region in the Loire Valley. Uh, right over here, 
where this giant orange arrow is pointing. This whole green region right here is known as the Loire Valley, or if you're from France, the Loire Valley, uh, if you want to say it properly, which, you know, there's uh, different schools of thought with that. Uh, you know, we don't say croissant uh, when we're talking about croissants here in the United States, but a lot of people in the wine industry want to keep those French enunciations intact, and that's okay. Um, we do sometimes, we don't sometimes. There's no right or wrong uh, when it comes to those things, tomato, tomato, whatever your preference is. So in the Loire Valley, as you can see, we're in the northern part of France. You've got Paris over here, Champagne's way up here. Uh, and, and so this is a cooler climate region in France, coming off the ocean, following the river all the way uh, through. And this is white wine Mecca. Now, they do grow a lot of great red grapes, and we have a bunch of them in our room, Cab Franc being the most popular red grape of the Loire Valley. They also grow some Gamay that's a delicious, some Pinot Noir that's delicious. Uh, lighter body red grapes usually because, again, it is cool climate, so you're not going to have the sunshine and the warmth and the heat to get something like Cabernet Sauvignon as ripe as they do down in Bordeaux uh, or in California or Tuscany or the places where Cabernet Sauvignon does really well because it needs more sunshine, it needs more warmth. So for the reds, lighter bodied reds. For the whites, Sauvignon Blanc is the king of the Loire Valley. If you've ever heard of a region called Sancerre, it is where Sauvignon Blanc sees its greatest expression in the world. Now, we're not talking about any of those. We're talking about a little known grape called Melon de Bourgogne. So the Muscadet region is over here and it is on the coast and Muscadet is not the grape. So a lot of people get confused when we talk about this wine, because when we say Muscadet, they think either Muscat or Moscato uh, or Muscadine, and it is neither of those things. It is none of those things, and there is no sweetness in most of these wines. They are bone dry, and they are from a grape called Melon de Bourgogne. So the history of Melon is that it was widely planted throughout the Burgundy region. Burgundy now, as we know it, is famous for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but back in the day, there was tons of melon planted in Burgundy, the melon of Burgundy, hence its name, Melon de Bourgogne. It fell out of favor in Burgundy, and they transplanted almost all of the melon over to the Muscadet region in the Loire Valley in France, and it just did great. And so uh, they saved the varietal from extinction by planting it in the Loire in the Muscadet region. And now there's some amazing wines being made from the Melon grape. This wine in particular, this lovely gentleman in the vineyard, uh, Mr. Marc Olivier, he is the man when it comes to the white wines from the Loire Valley. He also does some great reds. We get small amounts of some of them. We have his Cab Franc in the room right now. If you're a Cab Franc fan, small production, really, really beautiful. Uh, has a rooster on the label. Lots of fun. Um, but he's known for Muscadet and he's known for Malone, especially his crew designations. We have one of them in the store right now. We've got one bottle left of his Clisson. And then we have a couple others that will be coming to us throughout the next couple months. Um, and he really is known as the master of Muscadet. That's what he loves. That's what he does the best. That's what he's most known for. His other wines are amazing as well, but the white wines are his bread and butter. So he became very popular, cultish, like a lot of our small natural producers tend to get. And his high-end wines became almost uh, impossible to find. Then one year, he was hit with hail and lost most of the production of his vineyards. And so he had to start sourcing from other vineyards. Up until that point, and I can't remember exactly what year it was. Aliyah, if you uh, know that, you can chime in. Um, and 2016. 2016, thank you. So as with most uh, creative people, he took what was a disaster and created something that would become a hallmark of his wines. And that is 
his La Pepe line. So La Pepe is the line that he creates using fruit that's sourced from outside vineyards. He started in 2016 out of necessity, and now he continues to make the La Pepe line because it became so popular and because he could produce more of it. So he only owned a certain number of vineyards, so he could only make a certain amount of wine every year. He was limited to his vineyard holdings. And for years and years and years, he said he would never uh, make wine from a grape that he didn't grow. But again, because of disaster, because of necessity, it opened him up to the possibility of a wine that we can keep in stock on a regular basis on the shelf, which is absolutely amazing for Marc Olivier's wines. He is the man. This wine is absolutely beautiful. If you haven't gotten into it yet, you should have not waited for me, um, but get into it again. And I am going to uh, dive in as well. Aaliyah, what are your thoughts on this new vintage of the Muscadet from La Pepe? This is a wine that I always look forward to because it's a wine I love to start people with. It is, the price is the right price. And, and for people that aren't really sure where they want to start with white wine, it's refreshing, it's crisp, it is obviously great with food. The typical would be oysters, but I do think it would be, of course, amazing with Thanksgiving food too, hence why we put it in the pack. Um, and I just love how... To me, it's very versatile, and I think I've probably dropped that word a lot on a lot of our calls, but that's because that's something that's important to me in the wine that I drink. I want to be able to drink it in a lot of different settings and to um, share it with different types of wine drinkers, and that's what I love about this and um, why I always look forward to it. And it's, it's one that in the back of my mind, after every shift it fermented, I'm like, should I take a bottle of that home with me? Like, that's, this is one of those wines for me. It is. And it's a wine that we sell a lot to Sauvignon Blanc drinkers who are looking to branch out of Sauvignon Blanc. So for those of you who are white wine drinkers and, and red wine drinkers for that matter, um, you know, we don't carry a lot of the same grape. So we don't have 100 Cabernets and 100 Chardonnays and 50 Pinot Grigios and 50 Sauvignon Blancs and 50 Pinot Noirs. Uh, if we did, that's all that would be in the shop. And that would be really boring for me and really boring for the rest of us. Um, and so our approach is to have a couple of the popular varietals and then have some other wines that are like them uh, that we can show you. And this is one of those wines that is like Sauvignon Blanc in the way that it drinks, meaning that it has high acid. You feel that right on the back of your uh, cheeks right here when you take that first initial sip. That's the acid of the wine. Any wine that's going to be high acid is going to leave you kind of puckering a little bit back there. The next indication of the acid is the salivation after you've finished enjoying the wine and after that taste has left your palate, you're left salivating and, and that's getting you ready for food, that's getting you ready for more wine. Uh, and then the other reason that it's like Sauvignon Blanc is because it's dry and crisp on the back end. It has about the same weight as a Sauvignon Blanc, especially a Sauvignon Blanc from France. And it has that beautiful citrus and just a little bit of herbaceousness on the very, very back end. So subtle, but so beautiful. Uh, the balance is here. This is also a wine that is aged Sir Lee. Sir Lee means that it rests on the particles left over in the winemaking process, the dead yeast cells, the pulp, uh, some of the skins that may have been left behind. And it adds richness and weight to the wine. So most Muscadet, if you look on the bottle, you'll see Sir Lee, S-U-R-L-I-E. And that just means that it has rested on the lees of the wines for an extended period of time. Uh, this is uh, used a lot, especially in Muscadet. They do use it in other regions and with other white grapes as well. So notice that if it says it on the bottle, if you're looking at a white wine, it means that it's going to have a little bit more richness and a little bit more complexity. This wine, as Aaliyah mentioned, this is an oyster wine. Uh, this is classically known as the oyster wine because you can get fresh oysters in Muscadet right off of the boat, crack open a bottle of Muscadet and just drink the Muscadet eating raw oysters and it is a match made in heaven. The saltiness and the brininess of the oysters paired with the acidity and the citrus of the fruit, it's almost like putting uh, citrus on the oyster itself, which a lot of people do. Um, and so you don't need any 
accoutrements with your oyster if you're drinking muscadet. The muscadet is the only accoutrement that you need. So I encourage you, if you have the uh, means availability of finding fresh oysters, to crack a bottle of muscadet and eat some fresh oysters uh, because it is an amazing pairing. Stainless steel, natural yeast, uh, no fining, no filtering, very, very natural, small amount of sulfites added in bottling, and that is it. Uh, minimal, 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 no intervention, very classic producer. Again, Mark Olivier is the winemaker owner of this, and ceviche, yes, fish tacos, yes. This is a great turkey wine. So turkey can go either way. We'll start talking about it a little bit. Uh, turkey, because you have white meat and because you have dark meat, and then depending on your preparation and depending on the kind of gravy that you're putting on your turkey, those are all going to influence the wine that will pair best with your turkey. But if you're just enjoying white meat by itself, this is an absolute dynamite pairing with that. If you have any seafood on the table for Thanksgiving, uh, it would be wonderful with that. It's also going to be uh, really delicious with sweet potatoes. Uh, I would really want to enjoy this also with, um, oh, corn casserole. I think it would be really, really delicious with as well. And the options are limitless. Again, a great starter wine, a great wine to have on the table for the white wine drinkers, and a great wine to try with different dishes that you have in your lineup of Thanksgiving classics. All right, on to what should always be on the table at every holiday gathering, and that is rosé. Rosé is not just a summer wine. Rosé is an amazing, versatile, year-round wine. And this one, we're excited that it came back in stock because we didn't think that we were going to get any more this season. It happens a lot. Sometimes the wine runs out and we don't get any more for a few months. But every once in a while, we're surprised and we think that a wine has run out, but we get a surprise shipment just at the right time. And this happened with the Division Gamay Rosé. This was one of the most popular rosés during the summer, and it is just absolutely dynamite. This is done by Division Wine Company. If you don't know them, you should get to know them because everything that they do is absolutely outstanding. We are in Willamette Valley, right up here outside of Portland. Willamette Valley, known for Pinot Noir around the world. It is next to Burgundy, in my opinion, the most important place in the world for Pinot Noir, followed by, uh, and, and not even followed by, I'd put it right there in the same category, Santa Barbara County down in Southern California. In my mind, the three best spots in the world for Pinot Noir. Um, they grow a lot of other things outside of Pinot Noir in Willamette Valley that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, they do some great Italian varietals in the Willamette Valley, and then they also do some great Loire varietals in the Willamette Valley. So we were just talking about the Loire Valley in France, and it's important in this transition because the winemaker here, Kate Norris, uh, you can see her right here in the pictures, the only female here working at the winery. Uh, this was co-founded by her and her partner who have since split up. So now she is the primary uh, owner and winemaker here. We had her on a Zoom tasting over the summer. I mean, she's just lovely, uh, an amazing person, an amazing human being, and making some amazing wines. She studied in the Loire Valley. So a lot of the young winemakers in the United States have traveled to other regions in the world to apprentice with different wineries. And she apprenticed in the Loire Valley and has been very influenced by the wines of the Loire Valley. That's why outside of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay that she does really, really deliciously, she also makes a Sauvignon Blanc, a Chenin Blanc, a Cab Franc, a Cab Franc blend. Uh, and a bunch of grapes that are popular in the Loire Valley, including Gamay. So this is 100% Gamay Rosé. I got to finish up my Muscadet real quick uh, and get into that. They do have an urban winery here as well, uh, which is really, really cool. And when COVID is over, we can't wait to get out to Oregon to meet Kate and try some of their wines on site. But until then, we will enjoy them here and dream about the day that we can go to uh, the Pacific Northwest to do some wine tastings with these amazing winemakers. This is a tiny production winery. 
most of their wines are less than a thousand cases in production and we get kind of drops of them here and there uh their pinot noir un we've been out of for about a month now but it should be coming back before christmas time uh the gamay rosé we were out of for about two months and then it finally just kind of made a surprise shipment and we have their cab franc blend as well and some of their higher end wines pinot and chardonnay also I definitely suggest trying them out because everything that she does is impeccable and beautifully balanced. So this wine is 100% Gamay. Now, rosé can be made in one of two ways. Uh, it can be made by using a red grape and limiting the skin contact, or it can be made by blending white and red wines together. This is 100% Gamay, a red grape that sees limited skin contact. So the color of the wine is coming from about uh, 72 hours of skin contact, give or take. If she was making a red wine from Gamay, which she does make a red wine from Gamay, to get the color difference using the same grape, it would be about a two-week maceration or skin contact to get the full red flavor out of that grape so the color from wine is coming from the grape skins that's why you can have a dark white wine that sees skin contact also known as orange wine or you can have a light rosé pink colored wine being made from red grapes limiting the skin contact so the color how dark it is is all about the amount of skin contact in that wine and that's why we have varying colors of rosé it doesn't mean they're sweet because they're darker in color, that's a misconception as well. It just means they have more flavor because the skins have been in the juice longer, extracting more color and extracting more flavor. So this is a very light rosé, much in the style of France, the Loire Valley. Uh, they make a lot of Gamay rosé and Cab Franc rosé in the Loire Valley and some really, really beautiful ones. Uh, this is 100% single vineyard. Uh, and I was actually wrong. I forgot that this is coming from Washington State. Uh, I apologize. I gave you some misinformation. She makes a Gamay from the Willamette Valley, but this is coming from the Columbia Valley uh, AVA from the Carousel Vineyard. So she's sourcing this from Washington, not Oregon. Uh, and the result is a beautiful, well-balanced, elegant rosé. Uh, Destemmed. Immediate press means that it's just pressed off immediately when those grapes go into the hopper. Um, she separates the juice into four different temperatures and then ferments uh, four different tanks and then ferments at different temperatures, each of the wines to give it subtle complexity and nuance because you're going to have different flavor components from each of those different fermentation uh, temperatures. This is also another high acid wine. So you get that little tinge right in the back of your mouth, salivating after the wine leaves your palate. Strawberry, cranberry, a little bit of spice on the back end and just beautiful weight, flavor, complexity, balance, and amazing food wine. Rosé is the most versatile pairing wine that exists. Anytime that I'm stuck in a pairing crisis, uh, rosé and bubbles are my get out of jail free cards. Those always work well when no other wine will work well. And so you can have this with everything. This is great with turkey. This is great with sides. Even if you're throwing some really rich gravy on there, it still has enough to kind of stand up to it. It's also great and you don't find this very often. It's great with vegetables that are very difficult to pair. So broccoli, broccolini, asparagus, uh, any green vegetables that will throw off white wine and will throw off red wine and make them taste weird. Rosé goes really, really well with that. Any kind of salads. Uh, so it's great for the first kind of courses that you're going to be preparing uh, and will stand up with pretty much everything that you can throw on the table excuse me, maybe even dessert. You should try this with dessert just to see if it goes with pecan pie. Uh, I have an inkling that it would be really, really good. Um, the bitterness of that pecan, that sweetness. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I might have to do that this Thanksgiving. 
Mm. Uh, if you're not doing, or when, when you're not doing Thanksgiving, particularly, this is awesome with salmon. Really, really delicious with salmon. Uh, chicken salad, duck, rare lamb, charcuterie. If you just get some meats and cheeses, put them out on a board, this would go with almost everything that you have on that board. Uh, I forgot to mention prices on the very first one, $23 a bottle. Uh, on this one, $25 a bottle. So great values for what they are. Uh, limited production. This will go bye-bye again and will not be released until the next vintage, probably early spring next year. And we love it. I hope you do too. All right, into the reds. I'm going to finish this up real quick, and we're going to travel to Italy with one of the most popular wines in the room since we opened. Uh, another winery that we had a Zoom call tasting with this summer, and just amazing people. I say that a lot, but, you know, that really is the heart of what we do. We want to support great people who are uh, conscientious winemakers, who are conscientious uh, environmentalist and conscientious human beings. Um, we want to support good people. We want to support farmers. We want to support people who are going to give back uh, and who make great wines that are not manipulated. I forgot to mention this is also very natural. Small amount of sulfites of bottling and that is it on the rosé. So on to Grenache from Ampelea. This is their Capos. So Ampelea is the winery, and it was started by a group of friends. You can see them all right over here. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to take a rundown estate in Tuscany and turn it into a world-class vineyard. And so they came alongside of another winemaker who we're a huge fan of, Elisabetta Foradori. She was the consulting winemaker for them when they were getting started and has since uh, stopped making the wine, but still consults with them. And she is a huge believer in biodynamic farming practices. So biodynamic farming practices take all of the organic principles and then amplify them. Following the cycles of the moon, going above and beyond organic principles essentially to make the most holistic vineyard environment possible. You can't make great wine without great grapes and you can't make great grapes without great farming. And that's kind of the process that the greatest wineries in the world follow. Uh, they're not manipulating their wines with chemicals and they're not manipulating their wines with technology. So their wines are left naked, essentially. There's nothing to fix them if the grapes aren't of the highest quality. And so for these winemakers, the reason that it's so important that they farm so well is because they need the most pristine grapes possible to make the best wine possible. It's going to be a little different every year because the environment's a little bit different. The vineyard's a little bit different. The weather's a little bit different. And so every year there are going to be subtle nuances in the wine, but because they pay such attention to farming, those differences are to be celebrated, not lamented. And you still have the identity of the heart of the grape and the heart of the vineyard from these producers, even if the wine is a little bit different in its appearance and in its substance year after year. So this is in Tuscany, uh, known as a super Tuscan because it falls outside of the normal laws of Tuscany. It's labeled IGT on the label. If you see that moniker, if you have a bottle there at home, which means uh, that it's an Italian table wine, um, basically. It's the lowest level of classification when it comes to Italian wines. There's IGT, DOC, and DOCG. Uh, to fall into a DOCG and DOC, you have to follow laws of that region on what grapes you can grow, uh, what percentages you can blend in, what kind of oak you use, how long you age it, the alcohol levels minimum and maximum. There's a lot of different things that you have to do to be able to fall into the DOCs and DOCGs. And so in the 70s, there was a group of winemakers who didn't want to do this. They wanted to do what they wanted to do and use the grapes that they wanted to use. And so they created this class of wines from Tuscany called Super Tuscans, uh, which don't fall into the regular laws of Tuscany. 
Ampelea, all of Ampelea's wines are considered IGT and considered super Tuscans. They're just using different grapes and different vineyards for each of those wines. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is their Capos. It is a Grenache blend. Grenache is known as warm weather Pinot. It drinks a lot like a fuller bodied Pinot. And for Pinot lovers, Grenache is one of the places that we try to take them to break outside of their Pinot box, especially if they like fuller bodied Pinot Noirs because Grenache fits that description beautifully. Uh, this is blended with a little bit of Carignan and a little bit of Mavedra as well, following the classic Rhone Valley formula. So in the Rhone Valley, Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra, Carignan, Cunha, Cinso are all used together as a Rhone blend. And winemakers all over the world follow this blend for those grapes. Uh, California does it, Tuscany does it, Spain does it, uh, South America does it, Australia does it. All of the great areas of the world to grow Grenache have kind of followed the Rhone process and formula. They also do Grenache on its own and it's amazing on its own as well, but this is blended with a little bit of Carignan, a little bit of Mavedra. If you had to ask me what the best red wines are to pair with Turkey and Thanksgiving, I would tell you it's Grenache, whether it's from the Rhone Valley or from Italy or from Spain, uh, Gamay and Pinot Noir. Those are going to be my top three turkey pairing red grapes because they all have beautiful flavor, complexity, balance. They're all a little bit more elegant if they're treated traditionally and, and not allowed to get overripe and too high of alcohol, which does happen sometimes with these grapes in different parts of the world. Um, and they're all just classic Thanksgiving wines. So uh, we love Grenache. Coach de Rhone goes great with turkey as well. Uh, but this one in particular is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful expression of Grenache. So biodynamic grapes, as I mentioned, they are farming everything on their property biodynamically. They believe very much in the process. And I will have to say that a lot of people think biodynamics is hocus pocus. Uh, I have personally discovered through the years that some of the most memorable wines I've ever had in my life are from biodynamic vineyards. I didn't realize it at the time with a lot of them. I came to find that out later, years later, after doing research on a lot of those wines and learning a lot more about wine through the process of the journey. And once I kind of connected those dots, uh, I've never looked back. I do personally believe that biodynamics is the best practice for uh, growing grapes and maintaining a healthy vineyard. Mm. So, medium body, dark cherry, tannin on the back end, but it's a softer tannin. It's not an intense tannin. It dissipates pretty quickly. If the tannin is ever too much for you in wine, decant it for at least 30 minutes up to an hour and a half. What's going to happen as the oxygen interacts with those tannins, and tannins are a natural component of the grape skin. So if you bite into a grape when it's on the vine, it's going to be bitter that bitterness is coming from those tannins. Uh, so tannins can be bitter or they can be sweet. These are sweeter tannins. So the grape was a little bit riper. And so those tannins went from a bitter tannin to a sweeter tannin or a softer tannin. The tannin is there to preserve the wine long-term for aging. So 15, 20 years in the bottle, uh, the tannins are gonna slowly dissipate. When you decant the wine, you're speeding up that process and the oxygen will begin to eat away at the tannins, softening the wine as it decants. The tannins will lessen and lessen the longer that that wine is decanted. The other thing that tannins are great for, not only preserving the wine, they're great for food pairing with something that's rich. So if you have a really rich gravy that has a lot of fat in it, that has a lot of richness in it, and you're slathering that all over your turkey and your mashed potatoes, which I encourage greatly, uh, this wine is going to the tannin is going to bind to that richness and that fattiness, and it's going to cut through the tannin. 
It's going to change the way the wine uh, tastes, and it's also going to change the way that that food tastes. The food's not going to be quite as rich on your palate. The tannins are going to lighten it up a little bit. The acid's going to cut through some of that fat as well, making this a really, really, really good food pairing wine. Uh, you know, outside of Turkey, uh, this would be great with grilled meats, uh, like pork belly. It would be amazing with the smokiness of that pork, the fattiness of that pork, uh, with the richness of this wine. Absolutely dynamite pairing, uh, roast lamb. Yes. Burgers always bigger and richer pasta dishes. Yes. Stews, uh, anything with braised meat. This would be really, really good with, um, anytime again, richness, in food, you want tannin and wine to cut through the richness of that food and to lighten its intensity on your palate. Uh, this would also be great with uh, Asian cuisine, especially Korean barbecue. Uh, the umami of the sauces in that paired with this wine would go absolutely beautifully because there is a little bit of umami in the back end of this wine as well. Um, that little bit of savory uh, component on the back end. Asian concrete tank, so no oak on this wine. Very fresh, no added sulfites, and AKA no hangover the next day. Uh, it is an absolutely stunning wine. Again, if the tannins are too much uh, for you, decant it or just let it sit open on your counter for a few hours. Uh, go back to it the next day, and it's going to change completely. Um, this is a wine. If I have it and I leave it open on the counter, I always like it better day two or day three, even though I absolutely love it on day one right out of the gate. $33 a bottle for this. And one of the few wines that we've had in the store since we opened over two and a half years ago. I think I did a count uh, a few months ago and we're down to a, about five wines in each section of the store that have been on the shelf since we opened two and a half years ago. As you know, we like to change things a lot. We also carry a lot of really small producers that we just can't keep in stock all the time. And so the room is constantly evolving and constantly changing, but there are a few wines that have managed to stay on the shelves since day one. And they're the perfect balance of there's enough production of them, even though they're very small production. Uh, and they are so popular that we could not take them off the shelf, even if we wanted to take them on the shelf. And there's nothing better for the price point and the varietal that you're getting. Uh, in our opinion, I have never tasted another Grenache at this price point that tastes nearly as good as this one does. So hopefully you love it. Great turkey wine. And we are going to get into uh, our final wine of the evening, the Maison Noir, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. Uh, Aaliyah, you look like you've been busy. What's your thought on the Capos? Whew. Wow, guys, what a Wednesday. Um, Capos, I love the Capos. I think what Lauren said is absolutely correct. Great with stuffing, with or without the meat. I think that's so true. Um, one of the first wines I think I had in the shop. So it, of course, will always be special. But I love that the spice, I love the tannin, I love the earth, the fruit. It just has all of those components to me that make it a very, oh no, I'm going to do it again, versatile. Versatile. Versatile <laughs> uh, food wine. Plus their, their estate, their family, their story is so cool and so unique. Um, just love that about them. And I agree for the price point, it's, it's hard to beat. It is. It really is. Uh, and you can say that I think about most of the wines in the store. Um, we always want the wines to drink outside of the price point, no matter what you pay for them. We always want them to be the best representation of that price point since we don't have a lot of wines. I was talking to a new customer today and kind of explaining our philosophy. And we, we have more of a Trader Joe's philosophy than we do a Walmart philosophy. Uh, you know, if you go to Trader Joe's, there's only one ketchup option. There's not 25 different ketchup options that all kind of taste the same. They find the best ketchup. They only have one. Uh, and that's what you get. And I'll admit that when I first went to Trader Joe's 15 years ago, 
uh, it kind of threw me off and I didn't know if I liked it. But the more and more I went there, the more I appreciated that I didn't have to make a lot of choices. Uh, I was just going to get a great product at whatever was offered on the shelf. And that's what we want fermented to be for you. We want you to know no matter what price point you're going to be in and no matter what flavor profile you want to have that day, it's going to be the best that we can find. And that's what we put on the shelf. And that's why it's there. There's a reason for every wine that we have. Uh, and it's because someone enjoys it. Someone loves it. And we hope that that someone is you. Um, but not everybody's going to love every wine. And that's the fun of exploring. So on to the next wine. Uh, this is the Horseshoes and Hand Grenades from Maison Noir and Mr. Andre Houston Mack. Uh, amazing man. Grew up in the restaurant industry. We also had him on a Zoom call this summer. Wow, we had three of the four wines uh, that we're doing tonight on Zoom calls this summer. If you ever want to go back uh, and see the Zoom calls that we've had from the past, those are on our Vimeo page that you can access from our tasting page uh, on the website. So this is from Washington and Oregon. So I messed up on the Gamay and told you it was from Oregon when it was really from Washington. Well, this wine is from both Washington and Oregon. And if you look on the very back of it, you'll notice that it just says American red wine. It doesn't say Washington or Oregon. The reason for that is because uh, it's being split from both of those places. All states have laws on how much of a wine has to come from that state for you to put that state on the label. And it's not 100%. I think usually it's about 75%. Uh, varies a little from state to state. But because this wine is less than 75% of both of those regions, he can't put either Washington or Oregon on the label. He just has to call it an American red wine. This wine has been one of the most popular wines in the store since we picked it up over the summer. And if you like a bigger, fuller, richer, softer wine, you'll see why. Uh, this is a blend of Cabernet, Syrah, and Merlot. 64% uh, Syrah, 19% Merlot, 17% Washington. So you can see on those breakdowns, he's getting all of the Syrah from Oregon. He's getting the Merlot and the Cabernet Sauvignon from Washington. Barrel aged for 10 months. Uh, and a little bit bigger, a little bit richer, a little bit more weight, but still has good balance and finesse for a fuller bodied wine. There are some fuller bodied wines where it's just knock you in the face with alcohol and fruit. And that's fine. If you're looking for those kind of wines, we've got a couple of them in the store. We don't have a ton of them, um, but this is great when you're looking for a full bodied wine that has good balance, uh, balance of acidity, balance of fruit, balance of alcohol, uh, balance of weight. And you get those dark fruits, you get a little bit of mocha. And then you get a little bit of that sweet tannin on the back end just to hold it all together. Again, we always recommend decanting all of our red wines no matter if they're big, medium, light, no matter if they have tannin or if they're soft, all wine needs to open up a little bit. It needs to interact with oxygen. It's been stuck inside a bottle for two, three, four, five, six years, however long it has been since that vintage. And so it needs to breathe. It needs to open up to become expressive. Uh, so we always suggest decanting red wines. This one, man, I forgot how good this is. Uh, blackberry, uh, dark cherry, that little bit of mocha. Um, yum. Aaliyah, thoughts on the horseshoes and hand grenades? Yeah, this is actually, um, I do have this in my fridge at home. Uh, and because of that nice balance between, my husband prefers more of kind of like a modern rich style and I prefer a little bit more of a traditional style. So to me, this is a great compromise wine for us both because it gives me the structure and the, um, all the complexity I'm looking for and gives him that big richness, which I think is great. Um, Mr. Mac, just to harken back to the Zoom with him, he's got the energy of one of those people that you just want to be with him and be around him. He just has this great positive energy 
and that exudes out into all he does. And he is an incredible Renaissance man. He doesn't just own a restaurant in New York, which he does, and it's based around ham. Um, but he also has his wine. He is a graphic designer. He has his own t-shirt line and he's written a book. So he's doing it all. And then he's still just so positive and wonderful to be around. So anything he does, I'm going to want to drink it. Yes. Amen. So again, uh, if you have that rich gravy, if you have anything on the table that has some fat, uh, ooh, I just thought of bacon wrapped green beans because I'm pretty sure there's going to be some bacon wrapped green beans on my Thanksgiving table next week. Uh, the richness from that bacon, uh, and then that little bit of herbaceousness on the back end would go really great with the green bean, uh, bundles as we have them at my house. Um, stuffing yes again i always forget about stuffing because i'm not really a stuffing guy but lauren thank you for that uh the grenache would go great with stuffing i think this would go great with stuffing as well um and just a, a beautiful winery from a beautiful man uh who is as Aaliyah said a little bit of a renaissance man just a good soul uh all, all of these people that we're representing tonight and and we try to have everybody that we represent in the store uh be that beautiful great soul person uh that we want to support with our dollars because every wine that you buy from us not only supports us and our families but it's also supporting these families um and that's why we don't carry corporate owned brands of wine one of the reasons the other reason is because most of them are highly manipulated and chocked full of crap that i don't want to drink but the other reason is because with family-owned wineries, we know where our money's going. We know who it's supporting, and it's the people who are farming, the people who are living on the land, the people who are doing the right thing for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Um, and that's why we do what we do, to spread that message, uh, to make sure that you always have great wines to drink and to support great people so that we don't get to a place where the only thing we have to drink is manipulated wines because I don't want to live in that world. Uh, they affect me greatly. I can't enjoy them the way I can enjoy wines that aren't manipulated and are more natural. I wake up feeling like crap the next day. Um, sometimes even after one glass, uh, feeling terrible, drinking those wines that shall not be mentioned and named. So, uh, uh, again, that's why we do what we do. We love these wines. We love these people. Uh, we do have some curated gift packs for you, and all of these wines are from our gather pack uh, that we are doing for you. In addition to the four wines that you've just tasted, we also have a Lange Rosso from Northern Italy. It's lighter body than the Grenache, and it drinks a lot like a Pinot Noir. Very elegant, really beautiful flavor, complexity, color uh, by Luigi Giordano. And then we also have a beautiful, fun, unique, sparkling wine from Monterey, California called the uh, Biracino, and it's a Malvasia pet nat. So Malvasia is the name of the white grape that's being used to make this pet nat, of course, the natural sparkling style that we're all falling in love with. And it's really beautiful. It's very aromatic, and it is a great way to start the Thanksgiving feast. I always, always, always suggest starting with bubbles as you're cooking, uh, and then as you're getting into the food, Bubbles is always the best place to start, especially for holidays. And just to celebrate life every day should be a celebration of our lives. Uh, the Give Thanks pack, um, most of these wines are coming from our value wall and our table wine section. Uh, we have a Brut Cava to start with on the, the Give Thanks pack, uh, followed by a Dry Gewürztraminer, beautiful biodynamic Bonnie Dune Vin Gris cigar rosé uh, along with three reds uh, two from Spain a garnacha and a bobal the garnacha being a little bit lighter the bobal being a little bit fuller and then a red blend from Italy the Mercato Carne which has been one of the most popular bottles on the value wall the last couple months it has just kind of taken off uh, here in the store because it's so versatile it's so drinkable blend of Primitivo Nero de Avola and Nero de Troya. Uh, so those we have available. There is a 5% discount on those wines and we have them ready to pick up in the store at Fermented. Uh, or you can just put together your own four pack or six pack for your event. Or if you're getting 
a lot of people together, uh, then we can do some cases for you. As always, we love to curate for you. So just tell us a price point, tell us how many bottles you want and what style you want. We'll ask you a couple questions and then we can just put things together for you. That really is a lot of fun for us and for you. Uh, so now to the time where we all pick our favorite wines. Uh, this is always a tough part of the evening and a tough part of the tasting because they are all so delicious. So I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it. And if you can just give me a total per Zoom uh, call and how many for each wine, we will tally up the totals. Put them in the chat function uh, as you think about it. And Lauren has started this off with number one. Thank you, Lauren. Love the La Pepe Muscadet. Number one from Stacy. Stacy, great to have you on the call with us. Uh, Emily as well, one and four, perfect. The Blackstones, one, four, three, and two. Uh, you liked all of them. I love it. Uh, all right. But in that order. In that order. In that order. Got it. Love it. Okay, I got it. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, the Oberholzers, uh, great to see you all as well. We've got one, one, two, and four. Um, we're all over the place. Uh, I feel like the Pepsi, though, is for, pulling into the lead. It is pulling into the lead. Uh, Emily, I have to ask, though, I only see two uh, scores here, but I noticed you have four people there. Um, who is voting and who is not voting? Humphreys, did you not have favorites, or are you just leaving them out? Price point for four, thank you. Uh, $25 on number four. Um, so uh, 23 for the Muscadet, uh, 25 for the Rosé, 33 for the Capos, and then 25 for the Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. All right, so I am going to have to say, oh, it's so hard, but, man, I am happy that Division Gamay Rosé is back, so I'm going to have to go with Division Gamay Rosé for me on this one. Aaliyah, what are you thinking? Oh, well, I, uh, I, my gut reaction was the Muscadet, so that's what I'm going to say. All right, so it looks like the Muscadet is our winner from the night which is uh, no surprise because it is amazing. It is delicious. It is a steal for that price point and absolutely love it. I want to thank you all again for joining us this wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. Uh, we are taking off next week in for Thanksgiving. I was trying to think of the right way to transition that, but my words are escaping me. It's eight o'clock. There's a baby crying upstairs that needs to be taken care of. Uh, so no tasting next week. We're going to take the week off. Followed up the first week in December by blind tasting. It's going to be amazing. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You can't cheat, so don't look at the bottles. If you take home a full bottle kit, if you pick up a personal tasting kit, you're not going to have any labels on the wines. Uh, and then 12.9 natural wine. I don't remember the tasting after that. Taking off Christmas. Uh, oh, yeah, Christmas table. Sorry. It's, it's, it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, and then we'll be taking off Christmas and then finishing up with something for uh, New Year's. We are open normal hours next week except for Thanksgiving. So Tuesday, Wednesday, 12 to 9. Close Thursday, uh, Friday, Saturday, 12 to 9. Sunday, 1 to 7. Uh, this coming Sunday, 1 to 7 as well. We are closed on Monday. Um, but we'll be there ready for all of your wine needs. Uh, so come stock up, send your friends to come stock up. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in the store again. Thank you all very much. Uh, we you. appreciate your support. We love the fermented community. Uh, thank you for joining us on these tastings and joining us on your own personal wine journey. Um, if you haven't signed up for wine club yet, you should, uh, definitely check into that as well. And then we've also got some great gift packs, uh, going out for gifts this Christmas. Um, anything you need to do with wine, we're here. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> uh, so thank you all very much. Have an awesome night. Thank and you. We'll so much fun. A couple weeks. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Yeah, we enjoyed it. Cheers. If we don't see you before, then happy Thanksgiving to you all. Happy Thanksgiving.
I should show you how I sliced open my tasting kit. On How'd the, you do it? On the rosé. It was screwed on so tight. I couldn't, I had to go into the kitchen <laughs> and cut it off. <laughs> oh, it I'm sorry. I won't do it so no, tight it's next fun. time. <laughs> All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Funny. Have a great night. Bye. Why can't I stop? There we go.